Good evening, ladies. Good evening. We're so <laughs> glad you're here tonight in spite of the threat of the hurricane that never really happened here, but obviously many are, others are struggling with today. So please remember to be in prayer for those. Um, a couple of announcements. Next Wednesday is first and foremost. We want to make sure that you don't come here. Well, you will come here, but you won't find all of us. It will be a different group. So we'd love to have you on first and foremost next Wednesday, but just be aware that it won't be the same uh, women's ministry program. And then following Wednesday, we'll start right back up with uh, with Mark. Um, have have y'all been learning? It's been amazing, hasn't it? I uh, I found myself spending a lot of time with the idea of Jesus. The last line Karen said. The Son of God is Lord, even of. And you know, it's even of the Sabbath, but when she put it up here, she left it blank. And you know, you start out and you think about all the exceptions that that creates in your head, right? And I realized that really what I want to do is run up there and jump on that little line and just be me. <laughs> I want him to be Lord of me. I don't want it to be little parsed out bits of me that I have this little thing over here that I'm protecting or this little thing. There is nothing about me or anything that I have that if God choose to take it or bless it, I won't be better off. You know, there's nothing for me to protect. There's nothing for me to spare. I used to have a shirt. This is what came to mind. And then I'm going to let Camilla give you an announcement. I used to have a shirt when I was in high school, and it said Jehovah. God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and me. And it was my favorite shirt because that's who I want to be. And I really hope that if you are being challenged by this material, because I certainly am being challenged by the word of God through it, that you will let go. If you've never let go before, do it now. Whatever it is, it seems more important than it seems too big to, to let go. Whatever it is, I promise you, you will not. Jesus is faithful, and he will take care of you. You do not have to fear. Um, Miss Camilla, do you want to give us, just she's going to give us a quick announcement about Women's Missionary Union. Alright, so 
um, we're up to session four. And um, so we know that uh, if you've been here and just reading the board there, you know that our, 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 the title of our series is Following Jesus Immediately because that word we see in the Gospel of Mark over 40 times. That is three times more than all of the other New Testament books combined. It's used uh, over and over and over again. And the Greek word for the immediately here is euthios. And it means straight away with nothing in between. And uh, it's a really good description of what we've seen so far in this book and in the letter. And so last week, if you were here, you saw the confrontation with Jesus, with the Pharisees. And they asked him question after question after question. And um, he, he moved rapid fire through that, uh, those discussions. And as we move along in the text, we're just going to see it go, this pattern continue uh, again as we move really fast through things. And so far we discovered that Jesus really can't be ignored, right? Jesus, uh, um, uh, Mark gives us a picture of Jesus and, and it demands a response. We cannot choose to say after reading what uh, and understanding what Mark has here that Jesus is just a good man, that he's a nice guy, that he has some good self-help kind of things. Um, he said himself and demonstrated unmistakably that he is God. So the decision we have to make then by reading this and looking at it is that we accept all of what he says. Or we reject it and we accept none of it. You just don't get the option to pick and choose what you like and leave out what you don't like. Um, we have to bow to him as Lord and then yield our wills to his. Now, I had a plan when I first started doing this and was laying out how I was going to uh, teach these lessons. I was planning to skip from what we did last week all the way to chapter 4. But there's an important thing to talk about in chapter 3 that I felt like we really needed to cover. So I'm going to go rapid fire right across chapter 3 and uh, just kind of introduce what he's talking about here to get to what I want to talk about before we jump into the bulk of the lesson, which is in chapter 4. Um, because, uh, um, and if you want to talk more about in your groups or bring up something or go into it more deeply, feel free to go off the questions and just talk about whatever you feel like God is leading you to talk about. So in Mark chapter 3, uh, he just explores really the different reactions that the people have to Jesus. And like we said last week, we saw the, how the Pharisees reacted. They heard what he said. That he, they heard that, understood that he was saying that I'm God. And um, what they did chose to do is not say, wow, this is an amazing move of God. They chose to turn away from him and join themselves to their polar opposites politically and religiously, which is the Herodians. And um, they said that they were looking for a way to get rid of him and to kill him. So moving on to the chapter, we see that uh, the crowds here uh, are flocking to him. That's what it says in verse 8 here. And they come from all over the place. Now, this doesn't mean that all the people were genuine followers. Mostly they wanted to get what he offered, which is what verse 10 says, that they, had, they wanted his healing. And um, so that's really what those guys, you know, people were all around. They hear what he's, what he's doing, see, see what he's doing here and what he's saying, and they want to get in on it. And go on into the next section, verse 16 through 18, what we see here is this disciples, that is the genuine followers of Jesus here. We're going to get to know some of these guys a little bit better as we move on through the book. And then verse 21 tells us about how his family respond, and it shows that just being related to Jesus in a, 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 a biological family didn't mean that they were all on board with his ministry. In fact, they, he was very embarrassing to them because they're trying to get him out, out of the public eye. I mean, he's over here causing conflict with the religious leaders and in all, all around, and these crowds are flocking to them, and they're saying stuff that he can't really, that they can't really understand. And because they remember him as a teenager, they remember him as a kid, and they're like, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what he's talking about. So they try to get him out of public eye. And uh, that leads us really quickly up into the section I really want to talk about in chapter 3 before we move into chapter 4. And that's another encounter with a group of people. And they are the teachers of the law, or your Bible might say that they're scribes. Now, this group is different from the Pharisees. Um, there's some overlap between scribes and Pharisees, but they're two different groups. And these scribes are people who were experts in interpreting and applying 
the law, the law of Moses. And really what they did was they drew up legal contracts, marriages, inheritances, you know, things like that. And they interpreted biblical law for the people. Now, uh, so the Pharisees were not usually scribes, though there were some. But they were, uh, the Pharisees were more landowners and traders, but they could be scribes, but not usually. They were usually two distinct groups. And so when we get to verse 22 of this chapter, we see that these teachers of the law or the scribes, they looked at what Jesus was doing and heard what he was saying. And they began to accuse him, not of blasphemy, which is what the Pharisees were saying that he was doing. They were accusing him of worse that is being possessed by Satan himself and operating within with the power of Satan, which is a shocking accusation to look at what Jesus is doing and say, yeah, he's doing that by the power of the devil. That's exactly what they were saying there. So, and Jesus then responds to what they're saying with a parable. And yet this whole section here is, he's saying, yeah, how can Satan drive out Satan? If the kingdom of God is divided, or if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. And the point is clear here that Jesus is saying this. That makes no logical sense. What you're saying, he says, here I am freeing people from the clutches of Satan and driving out uh, 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 evil spirits. And uh, he said, if, if I'm doing that and I'm working for Satan like you're accusing me of, that would be undoing the work that he's trying to do it. So it doesn't make any sense at all. Then he says this really scary verse that a lot of people are, get worried about. He says, I tell you the truth, all sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He's guilty of an eternal sin. And you go, oh boy, eternal sin, that's really scary, right? And a lot of genuine believers read this uh, uh, passage here and live in fear that they have committed what is called the impardonable sin here. And they have been robbed of joy in their ability to serve because they're always afraid that this might be what they have done. So to understand what Jesus is saying here, you have to keep it in the context of what is happening and not just pull these verses out and say, well, it's this or that. Uh, but so this group of scribes here have looked at what is the obvious work of God. They've seen Jesus move, heard what he said, and they're crediting it to the devil. And that's clearly the issue, which is what verse 30 said. He said, because they're accusing him that he has an evil spirit. So these guys here are expressing willful, deliberate, defiant attitude of antagonism against the work of God's spirit. And Jesus warned them here that they were on the verge of becoming so hard-hearted in unbelief that uh, forgiveness was impossible. Now, not that God wouldn't forgive this sin, but that their hearts were so opposed to the work of God that they refused the forgiveness that was available to them. That's important. The issue wasn't with God. The issue was with them and with their hard hearts. So uh, when it says eternal sin here that he talked about in that verse, that means that they're, he's uh, hinting at and telling us that there is no pardon for a person who dies in the rejection of Christ. None. There are no second chances. There's no purgatory. There's no crane anybody out of uh, eternal damnation. When the door of death closes, your decision to reject him is forever. That's what he's saying right there. And this is why resisting the tug of the spirit is so serious. The Holy Spirit has been convicting a person of of sin, righteousness, judgment, and uh, has been showing a person that Jesus Christ is God's only Savior, but that person rejects and rejects and rejects the witness again and again and again. He is in grave danger that God will give this person exactly what they want. And, and that's like Romans chapter 1 says, that he will give them over to their sin. And to stifle his grace and his mercy and, and to be left alone in our sin is a frightening place to be, right? Jesus is saying their adamant refusal to believe the work of the Spirit that was right in front of them 
will live would eventually leave them so hardened in unbelief that they will not respond no matter what God tries to show them. And he will turn themselves, turn them over to the sin that they're grasping so hard to hold on to. So if you're a believer, though, you can't commit this sin. You can't. You have seen from Jesus for who he is, right? You have looked at him and said, I know he's the son of God. I know he's the world's only savior. You have accepted his call on your life and been brought into his family. You have already acknowledged who he is. You have yielded to the spirit of God, submitted to his call. And so this is not you. This, this, this passage is not you. So do we always need to be careful to, to listen and be pliable and yield to the Spirit? Yes, there is that call in the New Testament about listening and not hardening ourselves as believers to the Spirit. But that's a different thing than we're talking about here. So, But we as believers are not looking at God and attributing his work to Satan, to work of the Spirit to Satan. No, that's not what we're doing here. So if this verse has worried you and caused you anxiety and fear, let it go. You are, as God's daughter, you are never, ever, ever forsaken. You are 100% secure, secure. Rest in that. And don't worry about this. This is not you. So, all right, let's move on to chapter 4. And uh, so I was working on this lesson, and I really struggled with what to teach here because there's so much in this section here and how much time to spend talking about the parables and what to do with this section in the end about the, uh, the, um, the storm and all. And I went back and forth and in and out and worried Connie to death, <laughs> asking her questions about it. And the more I studied, the more I believed that there was a connection that joined the whole of this, this whole chapter here. Uh, as opposed to being separate uh, pieces that were just out there kind of hanging on, uh, because, mainly because of the way Mark writes, right? He is streamlined in what he, in what he writes. He is very careful about what he includes in the letter. Not a lot of fluff, not a lot of extra stuff here. And so I, I think, and he's very careful about how he lays it out that it all connects to point us to a point. But basically none of the commentaries I looked at or an explanation made a bridge between the parables and the end story about the storm very much. Um, but I just kept wrestling with it and I finally came to a conclusion. I think, oh, okay, I, get, I think I got it. And, and um, you know, and I think what I see in this chapter is something that we're gonna see repeated multiple times in the Gospel of Mark. But beyond that, it's also repeated in our lives over and over and over again. And uh, not just with the disciple, Jesus and his disciples, but it's a threefold pattern here that I believe God works in our lives to bring us to spiritual maturity and bring, bring us along, growing us up in our faith. And so we're not going to be highly detailed about what we talk about these parables. There's lots of things that you can look up and read if you want to learn more and more about the detail here. But we really don't have time to go through it in detail. But I think the, really the overarching connecting point is really the important thing to take away because, you know, like I said, I didn't see very many people talking about this at all. But I, it was, when I saw it, it was like so clear. And so I think when Jesus wants to change things in our lives, whether it be a habit or an attitude or a way to view the world or to understand God's kingdom, which is specifically what he's talking about in this chapter, it starts always with teaching. And that's what you see in the bulk of chapter 4, which is all the parables, verses 1 to 33. We'll go through and hit the highlights of these parables in a second. But if you want to change, you want to grow, you want to interact with people differently, you want to understand the world rightly, let go of the lies that you believe, it always begins with teaching. You have to be taught the truth first. And remember, in this time, Jesus is talking to a bunch of, a group of people and a bunch of uh, different ideas about the kingdom of God. It was very distorted. And uh, so Jesus shows up to do some realignment here, and which is what verse 26 and verse 30 said. He's like, this is what the kingdom of God is like. What should we say the kingdom of God is like? And so that's the point he's telling us here. He's helping people understand and realign their thinking about God's kingdom because what they had believed back in his time was basically that the way you get to the kingdom of God, the way God likes you is by following the rules, especially those, in, of course, those in the uh, law of Moses, but also the pharisaical rules that we talked about some last week. And um, so uh, that 
that had basically been the way they thought about it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You got to follow all the rules and you got to work really hard at it. That's what they believe the kingdom of God was like. And, but we, as we know, on this side of the cross, from reading the epistles and uh, Paul's letters specifically, is that that's the complete opposite of the way the kingdom of God works. And uh, we talked about this a little bit last week. But the laws handed down by Moses were moral laws, but they, and they were intended to guide their behavior. But it was not a pattern for how you reach God and how you make God like you. Uh, it was it, What the law really showed you is that you can't do it. You need a Savior to come and make you right in the right relationship with him. That's the point. Uh, and the Pharisee, Pharisees thought that the law well, uh, was the, of the utmost importance. But the truth is that no matter how hard you try, no matter how much effort you put toward it, the truth is you can't even keep one of the Ten Commandments, the very first one at all, let alone 613 that were all written down in the law of Moses. And that was the point. So a lot of what Jesus did was show up and unteach wrong views and wrong ideas to help them understand really what the kingdom of God was like. And so quickly through these parables, the first one here is the parable of the sower and the seeds. And the teaching really here focuses on the recipients of the word of God. And if you uh, have been out in church very long, you've probably heard this one. And it's in verses 3 through 8. And I'll, uh, so a quick overview here is that the farmer sows the seed. Some of the seed falls on the path and the birds ate it up. And some fell on rocky soil and it didn't thrive. And some on the thorns, some fell among the thorns and the plant was choked out. And then the last type of soil is the good soil that multiplies and brings forth a good crop and a great harvest. So we don't have to wonder about what this means. Jesus gives one of the only places where he explains the, the, um, the parable to them in verses 14 to 20 there. So it's pretty self-explanatory. And the point here is that the growth of the word depends on our receptivity. Do we, do we allow Satan to steal it, to troubles to wither it, worries of life to make it unfruitful, or do we allow it to take root, to grow, and to develop and multiply? And that's the point uh, he was making here in, you know, so that, that we're receptive to it when he talked to them about why he teaches uh, in parables. Now, interestingly, this is kind of opposite of what we usually think of an illustration is given for, right? Here, the pastor give you an illustration is supposed to help you understand, right? It's like, okay, it's going to give me more clarity, but that's not what Jesus says here. He says the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. And then he gives a quote from Isaiah 6 here. It says that they may ever be seen, but never perceiving, ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiving. And y'all can talk about that in your group tonight. That's one of the questions to uh, get through this. But this quote from Isaiah is when God calls Isaiah to be his prophet and tells him up front, people are not going to listen. They're not going to turn. So you're going to preach, but nobody's going to respond to this. And here in Jesus' day and all the way up to our day, too, we have the same thing, right? Uh, those who want to know, understanding is given, right? Those who continually reject, what they have is eventually lost or hardened against it. So those who receive and grow, like the parable says, are the ones who are responsive to the message to begin with. And physically, intellectually, you know this is exactly how it works. You fail to exercise a muscle. I mean, maybe you were in your 20s and you pumped out and you worked and you got these big muscles and you were in shape and everything. What happens a few years down the road when you stop? Muscles go away, right? Then he's like, where was that? I can't even pick up this little thing anymore. <laughs> and, you know, and, and so our muscles atrophy. That's why when you get older, they say, get up, move around, walk, because if you don't exercise that muscle, you use the ability, uh, you lose the ability to use it. Or mentally, it's the same. Bet you know this one, right? Maybe you want time, you used to spend time slowly reading through books or complex ma magazine articles, and you had... You, know, you reason through things when you're in college, you could decipher stuff. Guess what? Now we have our smartphones and a two-minute video tells us everything we want to know. If it's three minutes, 
That's too long. <laughs> I don't want that. And so our mental sharpness and our focus has diminished. And our, when we need our, that to uh, process more complex things or to think through things or we need focus on something, and then it's a lot harder for us, right? Because we haven't kept that reasoning power and that, that focus sharp. Uh, and this is so much more true in the spiritual realm because these things of the kingdom of God are not perceived by our own power. They are spiritual discernment is a gift of the spirit. And so we have to work really hard to hear his still small voice, right? I mean, we have to learn to pick it out of the background with so much noise in our world. So we have to work at that. And then we have to learn to apply what he says to our specific situations, even when he says things that are hard. And it takes initial receptivity to the truth, the bent in your spirit that says yes to God, even before you know what he asks. And uh, the consequences of not doing that is that we lose the ability to hear him at all. That's a really frightening place to be, that we've dulled our ears so much with the noise of the world that we can't hear what he has to say to us. So this parable of the soils focuses on the recipients of the gospel and distinguishes between those who ultimately reject the message and those who generally accept it. So next parable, really quickly, is uh, the next one is talks about the responsibility of the faithful hearer. So if you're in that that uh, fourth category of soils where you are, it is received and growing, then th this is the responsibility that you have. So once we accept the word, we're called to proclaim the message of salvation. And that's what he says in verse 21 to 24 here, the story of the, the lamp under the bushel. And uh, so our job as believers is to not to figure out what soil somebody else is. I mean, we don't have to show up and go, okay, I think you're rocky soil or you're the, the uh, that. We're, we're, Jesus says we're supposed to be like light, that we're not concealing the message, like hiding it under a bowl or under a bed or whatever, but to set it out in a location so everybody in the room can see it um, and receive the benefit of the light. The Gospel of John tells us that some people hate the light and turn away from it, but that, as believers, we're not to worry about that. Our job as the faithful hearers of the word is to put the light in a prominent place so that those who do want the light can find it. Next parable, we go on, verse 26 to 29. He gives us, this is, this is only found in the Gospel of Mark and, nowhere, and not in the other Gospels, but the point here is that as we sow the seeds, and we let our light shine, now we're reminded in this parable that, uh, that the growth of the seed or the growth of the kingdom of God isn't something we do, okay? So the point here is that of God's involvement in the seed growing process, right? Human ingenuity, uh, emotional manipulation, man-centered techniques, market-driven strategies, all of that kind of stuff will never create new life or spiritual growth within the heart of the person. Now, it's great to come up with new ideas, great to try new things, but regeneration and maturity comes only by the Spirit of God. That's his job. Now, the uh, believers are called to sow and to shine, like we saw in those two, uh, two previous parables here, but we can take zero credit when unbelievers respond in repentant faith. That's not us, that's God. Now, this is a really good news thing, right? I mean, what if it was up to you? What if it was up to you to say it right, do it right, talk to the person, give the right example, and uh, at the right time, in the right place, because if you didn't do it right, then they weren't gonna respond. I mean, what weight, how could you bear the weight of that responsibility that if you didn't do it right, somebody's not gonna be in heaven, <laughs> right? I mean, that's a really, really good thing that is not up to us, right? But what a great and loving father to invite us in on the process, right? It, you know, he can do it without us. But he says, come, tell your story. Sow the seeds. Let your light shine. And you get to be in, on the, uh, in the process of bringing somebody to find Jesus as their Savior. Hallelujah, right? That's amazing. So the pressure's off. But God does give you the privilege to be involved in what he's doing. Which leads us to the last parable in chapter 4 which is in verse 30 to 32. And this time, Jesus doesn't talk about a bunch of seeds. He talks about one seed, and this is the parable of the mustard seed. 
here. And um, so the disciples' responsibility is to sow, to shine, and most importantly, we saw God's involvement in the growth process. But when he does his thing, this last parable here tells us about the magnitude of the growth. And, uh, and so this is a little bit of mustard seed, and it's so small that it takes almost 20,000 seeds to make one ounce. It's a little tiny seed, but once one germinates, it can grow into a bush that's over 15 feet tall. So a little bitty beginning, really big uh, ending. So firstly, he's talking about himself when he's talking about the kingdom of God. Remember chapter 1? The very first thing Jesus said is, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So the kingdom of God coming near is him. <laughs> He's saying, I'm here, and yes, the beginning was as small as a mustard seed, right? Humble birth in a stable, and uh, coming out of Nazareth, and, and, and he was a rabbi and a teacher, traveling around with a bunch of tax collectors and fishermen as his followers, and this a little obscure part of the world over here. Yeah, really tiny. But when this seed was sown into the ground at his death and burial, and blossomed at the resurrection and the ascension that was huge in impact. I mean, here we are, 2023, still talking about what the impact of his life. There was no way to anticipate at the beginning what this was going to grow into and what God had in store for us. No way to see the eventual size and impact such from such a very small beginning. And then the parable is also it talks about us and, and our responsibility to share the gospel too. So when we sow small seeds of truth, plant it in a person's heart, put it out on the uh, where, in the light where everybody can see, it can have huge and far-reaching impact too. I mean, think about the evangelist who led 16-year-old Billy Graham to the Lord. Think about the shoe smell salesman with Dwight L. Moody. How much impact there was from that tiny little beginning, uh, huge impacts, so you just never know. You don't know what God has planned for the person that you're talking to right there in front of him because we have limited vision that God sees. And so we have a lot of teaching here on the kingdom of God, power of the truth in the lives of people, the scope of the impact, all of these things that Jesus is talking about, realigning their understanding and our understanding about what the kingdom of God is really like. But just learning the truth by sitting in a class like we are, or reading a book, listening to a pastor or podcast or whatever, that's not all there is. It's key, of course. You have to start with truth and uh, sow that into your life. But whenever we get a new insight, you can count on the second part of this process, and that is testing. And that's the end of uh, what Jesus does here at the end in verse 35 to 42. And this is the connection between the storm and the teaching and all the previous parables. So uh, the, Jesus has been teaching these people, uh, either large groups, small groups, with the disciples, all the way back to the middle of chapter 3. So there's a lot of teaching that's happened over here. And so when he gets done with it, Jesus says, let's leave and go over to the other side, what he says there. And so what he's doing here is about to give them a pop test. And so everything they've learned, everything they've witnessed so far, and so... He, uh, so uh, then it says, as soon as they got out there, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, so it was nearly swamped. So now several of the men who are on this boat, they are fishermen. And so the fact that they couldn't handle this boat and they responded the way they did shows you how furious the storm really was. I mean, you don't scare a fisherman with a little, a little rain or a little water in the boat. They're pulling water all the time when they pull the fish in with their nets. So the word for swamp there means filled completely. So this is a lot of water. It's filled way up. And so the disciples reacted naturally. They said, oh my goodness, we're going to die in this storm. Now they looked out at the empirical evidence around them. And then they made the natural conclusion, which is storm plus water filled boat equals death. Right? And that's where they went to. And so they're afraid. They're upset. Well, where's Jesus? He's in the back uh, sleeping on a cushion. And interestingly enough, this is the only place in the whole of Scripture that it ever says Jesus is asleep. And so, uh, now, uh, 
if they had applied what they had heard him say, what they had seen him do to their situation, they'd seen him heal, remember? They'd seen him cast out demons here, and uh, they, he's identified himself as God very plainly. Now, knowing all of this, seeing all of that, the logical conclusion is um, Jesus is not in danger from a storm. Right? This storm is not threatening Jesus, and because we're with Jesus, we're safe too. That's where the logical conclusion should have come, uh, so they basically failed this test. <laughs> because there, there in verse 38, this question is, is a rebuke. Jesus, aren't you paying attention? Don't you know what's going on? Don't you even care about us? That's the attitude of what they're saying right there. So he got up. And he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, be quiet, be still. Interesting enough, the wind and the waves obey him immediately. Not like we do, right? I mean, they just, it just responds. So once again, F on the test. They don't, get, they, they don't pass this because the point was not just to learn some interesting facts about Jesus or to see a miracle or knowing the head that, that his head, their head that he's the son of God. Um, the point is to, to believe to the point of putting their whole trust in him for everything even in this desperate crisis situation so jesus rebuked the nature and then he rebukes the disciples and he gives them this twofold question here why are you so afraid why do you still have no faith and the first question there the word for afraid is an adjective that means cowardly or timid so the question is really what's up guys what's the reason for this fear why are you afraid and the second question showed that they had really not grasped the truth uh, that the kingdom of God was present in the man that stood right in front of them. And so the fear implied a lack of faith, not just a lack of faith in general, but a lack of faith specifically in him and in his power. So for us, faith in Jesus isn't just for Sunday morning, right? It's for every morning. And even though we might hit situations that make us afraid, we have to take what we know, what we've seen, what's been revealed to us, and uh, then we have to lean on it more than we ever have before. Because all the teaching, all the testing is always for the point of trusting. You don't come to church, go to Bible school, Bible study, listen to podcasts or whatever just to learn more facts. That's part of it. We have to know the truth, like I've said before. But the point is always to lead you through this threefold process. Teaching, testing, for the point of trusting. So teaching, that's about another truth. Testing, do you believe it? Do you really believe it when you face the situation? Yeah, we can say we have all the right answers. Raise my hand in class and say, yeah, I know that answer. I know the verse. I know all that. But when you're tested on it, are you really to step out on it? And it's the point of leading you to trusting it. And so the last verse in this section is they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And so the answer should be obvious, right? This is the second year into them following Jesus. They'd seen enough. They'd heard enough and taught enough. But it did not change their knee-jerk re reaction to danger. So what the disciples did was they looked around and saw danger. They looked in and saw fear. Yet they failed to let what they had learned cause them to look up and see God. Let me say that again. So they looked around and saw danger. They looked in and they saw fear. But they failed to let what, what they knew and what they'd learned caused them to look up and see God. What does Isaiah 12, 2 say? Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The remedy of fear is to behold God. And you do that by being taught the word, to step out on it when you're tested, and then trust and not be afraid. And the reminder is that we'll all experience this pattern over and over and over again. Teaching, testing for the point of trusting. And you can look for this to look out in your life, work out in your life. 
Now, fortunately, Jesus is so patient, so kind, so long-suffering, and he will work with our struggling faith. And there are some things that you have to go round and round and round and over and over and over again. You're going to go teaching, testing, teaching, testing, teaching, testing to get to the point of trusting. I call it going around the mountain, right? So you learn something. You're all right. Okay, God, I'm ready to go on. And he's like, yep, how about this? And I'm, nope, let's go around the mountain again. And we come back up to Jesus, and you're like, I'm ready to go. Yep, let's try this. Okay, around you go again. <laughs> it's like, so we have to, there's a lot of things that we have to struggle with a long time. Um, you know, if you've got some in, in your background, past hurts, coping mechanisms, it can take a long time. And as we kind of wrap for tonight, I want you to look back over your life, start to see this pattern emerge where you're coming up to the same thing over and over and over again. Are you failing the test? Is he just saying, I want you to trust me? I want you to step out on what you really know and believe, even though the storm is raging around you? Trust, trust me. So you have the power to stop going around the mountain over and over again and to move through these cycles to the deeper things of God by learning to listen and obey even when you can't see clear. The good news is that growth, like we saw in the other parable, growth is never solely up to you, right? We, of course, have to make changes. We have to cooperate. We have to renew our minds. We have to make different choices because you're never going to have different outcomes if you don't ever do anything different, right? So we have to make some changes. Is God saying, let go of this, grab hold of that? We need to say, okay, yeah, I will do that. But remember, you as a believer in Jesus have the Spirit of God living in you, and there is nothing that you can't change or grow through with his power within you. There's always hope. Now, this doesn't mean it always will look out, turn out and look the way we want to. In fact, you know, I, you know, as long as I've lived, it's like, I think we, it rarely turns out the way we want to look, right? I mean, it's like you think it's going to go this way, and then suddenly, you know, two years down the road, you're in a completely different place than you were. But we can't overcome. We can grow. We can move on and be different through his power. Remember that, that, but it comes, though, not by focusing on growth, it becomes focus, it becomes reality by focusing on the identity of Jesus. Look up, behold God. That's where the change starts. Not trying to work really hard to do all the stuff. Cooperate, yes, but behold God. Know who he is. So don't look down on the path you're on. Don't look out at the circumstances around you. Certainly don't look in at your own feelings. But look up at Jesus and boldly answer the question, who is this Jesus? And the answers believers all, should always have is what Peter will say later on in the book of Mark is that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And in you, I can trust and not be afraid. Amen? Amen. All right. God, we just thank you that your word is so rich and deep and full and teaches us so much. God, thank you for your patience and your kindness and your gentleness to lead us down the path to spiritual maturity, even when we buck and we fight and we turn around and we are so resistant. God, please help us to see that you only want the best for us, that you only want what's good and right, even when we can't see it. God, help us to trust you. Help us to not look down or in or around, but always look up and trust you and not be afraid. For it's in your son's powerful, mighty name we pray. Pray. Amen. Amen.